Welcome. And thank you all for coming to support A Better Chance and its incredibly important mission to develop well-educated young people of color who can grow into our future leaders. Now, more than ever, their leadership is needed in our nation as we fight for a more just and equal society. My name is David Cox. I am an alumnus of A Better Chance, member of its National Advisory Council, and host of tonight's Creators for Color, sorry, Creators of Color panel. We're here to support A Better Chance's new initiative, Creating Leaders for a Lifetime. This event was designed in response to the cancellation of the A Better Chance annual awards luncheon. Through its three components, the alumni showcase, virtual luncheon, and virtual auction, Creating Leaders for a Lifetime will provide the critical operating support we need to address the organization's $1 million revenue gap head on. Tonight is the third session of the Alumni Showcase, and we've brought together some of our community's most prominent creatives to share how they've taken their ideas and passions to the market. Our first panelist is Roxanne Gay, Phillips Exeter Academy, class of 1992. Roxanne, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, uh, David. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I'm great. I'm so glad to be here with so many great writers and creative people. Um, I'm a writer and editor, a professor. So I kind of do a lot of different things. And uh, I write fiction and nonfiction, but not poetry. I'm very, very bad at poetry. Oh, and I also write screenplays. Excellent. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, next, we have Tochi Onyabuchi. Coat Rosemary Hall, class of 2005. Class of 2005. Uh, <laughs> hi, Tochi. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. Hi, I'm Tochi Yabushi, uh, also a writer, also very bad at poetry. Um, I do fiction, nonfiction, also getting into screenplays and TV plays and have a wee bit of a legal background, particularly in civil rights law. Excellent. Uh, and finally, we have Krishanda Lee Perez of Miss Porter School, class of 1994. Krishanda, if you say that you're bad at poetry, I mean, <laughs> but it's okay because I'm bad at poetry too. I'm going to plead the fifth about poetry. Fifth? I have tried. No, leave it at that. <laughs> um, uh, Krishanda Lee Perez, um, you just gave my age away a little bit. That's all good. Um, I, um, I'm really delighted to be here um, and inspired by so much of the work on the panel today. Um, I'm a writer as well. I write uh, nonfiction and fiction um, and also screenplays. My most noted work is our works of, of uh, fiction. I have a novel, Become as Girls We Leave as Women, which is a coming of age story about all kinds of girls from all over the place who happen to attend world famous boarding school in New England. Thanks a better chance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Krishanda. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to recognize our sponsors. Thank you to Bridgewater Associates, the Costas Family Foundation, Deloitte, DuPont, Henry R. Kravis, Lori and Peter Allen Atkins, Ronald R. and Mary H. Pressman, Skadden, Arps, Slate, Meager, and Flom, LLP, Stanley Black and Decker, and Theo and Dana Killian for making this event possible and for securing a better chance for the next generation. Okay, we got that out of the way, so let's get started. And I'd like to start with you, Roxanne. Many have read your stories and comics that explore themes of feminism, body image, and of course, what it's like to be a black woman. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you why you chose writing as your outlet as opposed to others. I think I've always been a writer. I've been writing since I was four years old. Uh, you know, of course, at four years old, I was writing the kinds of things that you would expect a four years old, four year old to write. I wasn't a prodigy, um, but I just loved it. It was always this way for me to tell stories and to enjoy my imagination. And um, that meant a lot to me to have that space to do so. And as I thought about the kinds of things I wanted to write as an adult, uh, you know, writing just felt like the perfect venue more than music or theater, even though I love theater 
um, it just was the right thing because when I'm writing, I feel like I'm always able to say exactly what I want to say, how I want to say it. And there is just no other realm in my life where I have that kind of confidence or clarity. Absolutely. That confidence and clarity is absolutely key to being able to express ourselves fully and uh, honestly and openly. Absolutely understand. Thank you. Um, Krishanda, uh, what do you use as motivation for your subject matter? Uh, is it personal experience? Is it societal events? And how does that ignite your imagination? Well, I love to observe people. And I was always told that interested is interesting. So I've always been interested in people and their experiences. And, you know, and I would often, you know, make up stories about people, just people watching if I was in the park when I was a kid and things like that. And that would inspire me to write some really, you know, uh, far out there tales uh, in elementary school and whatnot. Um, but when it came to my own personal stories and laying out my feelings, the journals were the biggest inspiration for me. Um, you know, the whole old school lock and key that you hope that nobody gets in, um, that made me feel like, wow, I can actually tell my truth. And I didn't know to call it my truth back then, but that's such a common phrase that we use today, telling and speaking your truth. Um, and then I, you know, became really interested in helping other people do the same. So. I've been helping people to, you know, writing their memoirs and um, and just, you know, coming from a place. I, I love to really come from angles about normal, quote unquote, ordinary people that are extraordinary, you know, um, delving into areas of people's lives that the average, you know, person wouldn't think to ask um, and um, and really helping people to realize that. You don't have to be, you know, something that that's seemingly on the outside extraordinary to really be a, a huge contributor to our, our the fabric of where we are. So um, I just am inspired by these people, everyday people. Absolutely. And I love that you uh, play that game about, you know, seeing people and trying to figure out what they um you know, who they are. My wife and I play that joke as well. We'll sit in the park and we'll be like, okay, who's a tourist? <laughs> who's not? Uh -huh. Who's a New Yorker? Who isn't? And then you have to give reasons why or why not. Always fun. Always fun. Definitely. Thank you. So Tucci. In Touching. thinking of sorry, sorry. <laughs> Tucci. In thinking about your success as a writer to date, what do you think is the key to connecting with readers? And when you finish writing a book or a piece, how do you how do you feel do you feel like it's a winner do you feel like it's going to do exactly what you want it to do i so with regards to that and sort of audience interaction audience perception uh one of the ways that i'm able to sort of keep most grounded and also sort of keep my sanity is to understand that ultimately i'm writing for myself uh i write the books that i want to read but also the books that like I want to write. And I found that the more specific you get in your storytelling, the more, you know, through the inherent, you know, empathetical magic of storytelling, the more universal the story seems, or the more universally the story can be read. And so as long as I am producing work that I'm proud of, work that I love, work that it is an honor to put my name on, uh, that to me is ultimately satisfying because like if, you know, it doesn't matter after that if, you know, there's a there's a bad review that comes out or like somebody, you know, drags me on Twitter or like, right. Uh, as long as I'm content and happy with and proud of the work that I did, like the rest sort of follows from there. Absolutely, because that's actually a part of telling your truth. You know, you're putting yourself out there and, you know, I mean you see what happens, but as long as you're proud of it, uh, everything else is just gravy. I definitely get that. Can I add sure, that? absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've been currently, I just started working with this organization, uh, another friend of mine from school, and um, it's called Self-Evident Media. And, you know, our job is to, through animation, help to bring these stories that a lot of young people and people our age don't know about. So there's stories like about Benjamin Banneker, there's stories about um, 1919, the summer, you know, that, that pivotal year. 
Um, it was one story that I just finished about Sojourner Truth that really blew me over. You know, I had heard the, the, the speech, Ain't I a Woman, for mm -hmm. years. And, uh, and I learned just, you know, not too far in the recent past that that was not the speech she gave. You know, she was actually someone who was raised uh, in the low Dutch country of a uh, county of uh, in upstate New York. Um, she spoke very good English and for our standards. And she didn't even speak in the drawl that we, you know, often phrase when we hit two A and I a woman. She would never even said, ain't I a woman? And, you know, doing some research, I learned that, you know, that version of her speech was rewritten by someone, a white woman who um, made that speech more popular. And it's a, you know, it's a fact. And I was just like, holy cow. Um, it was really exciting to be able to dispel that. But at the same time, um, for me as a writer, it just gave my writing even more purpose as a black woman and making sure that our stories are able to be told in the most authentic way and nobody else gets to tell those stories. So often we have found as black women, I'm sure, Professor Gay would speak eloquently to this as well. Everyone writes our stories. We're always being told, our stories are being told through someone else's lens. And so I didn't even think about the purpose I could serve as a writer that happened to be a black woman. But as I'm learning more, um, the older I become, I feel like I'm learning more than I learned when I was a kid. And that has influenced a lot of my writing as well. Yeah, you thank know, you. Uh, Go for it. Say, Krishanda talks about something that is has is very important to me. It becomes more important the older I get. So many people try to tell our stories, and when we're talking about the importance of storytelling, a lot of times people will say that I want to give voice to the voiceless, which is actually a really paternalistic and bizarre thing that people say to feel better about themselves. Uh, when in fact, nobody is voiceless. Everyone has a voice. It's a question of whether or not they have the means of amplifying their voice. And so one of the things that has been most important to me in my career, especially as I get toward the middle of my career, um, is being able to create opportunities, especially for black women, women of color, queer women, to be able to use their voices um, without any interference from gatekeepers. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and we're definitely going to get into some of the more recent uh, media that have come out uh, that we've been uh, privy to. Uh, but I'm going to start back with you, Roxanne. Um, so speaking to our audience, you know, even though our audience may not be filled with writers, we all face some kind of block, some type of creative block or writer's block at one point or another. Uh, what methods do you use to overcome this that you don't mind sharing with us? Well, when I figure that out, I'll, <laughs> I'll let you know. Absolutely. <laughs> I, you know, block is one of those things I deal with. I think all writers deal with it. And, uh, you know, I, I, in some ways, I actually write through it. I've been dealing with writer's block for the past three or four years now. And it's been really hard because normally writing comes easy to me. And I don't mean that, like, in a bragging way. It's just I'm not a tormented writer. I enjoy it brings me pleasure, and I tend to write very fast to actually do the work. But it hasn't been that way for the past four years, probably because I've been touring nonstop since 2014. And, you know, the more success you achieve as a writer, the less time you have to write. <laughs> and I've really struggled with finding, I, I write every day, but it's not fun. Or, more than that, it's not comfortable. And so I find that I have to just sort of grind through it. But when I'm really blocked, I try to just go do something that's creative, but not writing, whether it's going to a play, going to a museum to look at art. I find that art really helps me because I look at things like I saw this art exhibit at one a museum in Indianapolis once, and it was just like these strings, these strings stretch from the wall to the floor. And I was just like, I mean, I can do that. And the thing is, sure, we all think that, but I didn't. And so someone had the audacity to do that and to call it art. And enough people believe them that they got it in the museum. And so I'll start to go down that road. And I love the way art makes me think and makes me question 
creativity and what I understand, and it expands my understanding of creativity, I tend to be able to go back to the page after an experience like that and find something new to write because I think, just think of the string stretching from the wall to the floor. So I can do that, but with words. Nice, nice. I, I love that. I feel like I've heard That's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like I've heard that before as well, you know, kind of write through it, push through it. Mm -hmm. I deal with my own issues with writer, writer's block as well. Uh, confidence issues, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, imposter syndrome, oh, you sure. know, that comes up big time, not just in writing, but kind of in anything and everything that we do, because, you know, we want to be great. We want to be awesome. We want to be the best, but there are times when we feel like we're being told we're not. Mm. Please excuse me for a second. Traffic, you know, <laughs> web videos, such as life, right? <laughs> Actually, can I can I jump on something that you were that you were just saying, David? That reminds me of actually uh, a tweet. I spend way too much time on Twitter than is healthy for me. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it reminds me of a tweet that I saw. I think it might have been yesterday, even. And it was something along the lines of, you know, if you don't think at least 80% of your writing sucks, you're not a writer or something like that. And I'm sure the original poster meant to be encouraging and meant to signal to, you know, aspiring writers, people that are in it now, that it's okay to like not feel like you're, you know, producing your best work all the time. But for me, especially because so much... The, so much gatekeeping happens that keeps people from marginalized communities, keeps people from color from entering a lot of these industries, from entering publishing in particular. And so much of that is the imposter syndrome, is the like, I don't know if this book is good enough. I don't know if it's being, you know, rejected because, you know, it's not at the standard it needs to be at or because the editor can't relate to the black characters. And I, I pushed back against that because I, for me, writing is a source of joy. I like legit love doing it. Oftentimes if I'm blocked on a scene or a particular project, it's because I'm scared of something uh, inherent in it. Maybe I don't think, maybe I don't know what's going to happen in the scene as much as I need to know before I jump into it. Maybe I just need to think on it more. Maybe I just need to play some video games and like loosen myself up. Uh, but I, I want to, particularly for, for audience members that, that are creatives or wanting to be creatives, like, you can like your work. And also, too, if something ends up on the cutting room floor, that doesn't mean it's bad. It means maybe it's just not working in this particular project and what have you. So, like, I think that's another that's another sort of switch mentally that once I made, it was easy. It became much easier for me to do this writing thing because, like, it... I felt like an imposter pretending like I didn't like my writing, <laughs> you know, if that makes any sense. Cause I loved my writing. Like I'm good. Like, and I think that's what, you know, a lot of, a lot of writers, particularly writers of color are good. I mean, we have to be right. Yeah. We have to be, um, we're good. And like, we should, we should talk that talk. You know, we really should. And it's so, interesting because there seems to be this um, valorization of self-deprecation and like you're supposed to not admit that you're talented at writing and people often think when you say I'm good at this that you are saying I'm the only one who is good at this or I'm the best at this when in fact no we're acknowledging especially I think as black writers how hard we have to work and how good we have to be to achieve what we've achieved like if we were white, like we would be in the hall of fame. And it's frustrating to be able to not have space for that kind of discourse and just be like, I know what I'm doing here. Like, this is my thing. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, can I, may I add to that? Let me tell you, um, I believe that you have to hate your work or you had to hate, you know, that, phrase of 80% of your work before you felt confident. I mean, I literally was following this kind of like recipe to what it would, what it should take to be considered good. And then I doubled it because I'm black. Mm -hmm. I probably had another 10% because I'm a woman. So having all those on top of me, 
when it came down for me to write and to even publish my book, my, my novel itself is self-published. It's from a small publishing company, but by and large, it's considered self-published. And I remember just running through a litany of agents and, you know, the query letters and the, you know, just the, you know, the constant no, 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 no. And then I was also told by a mentor that, you know, you have to have as many rejections to cover a desk with wallpaper, you know, something like that in order for you to feel that you've arrived. So if you haven't been rejected 30 times and you haven't even gotten your teeth, you know, teeth, your feet wet. So I went through all of that, but then I started having these issues with the story. Now, my story is about a handful of girls who attend a private school in New England. Because I'm being true to the demographics, majority of them are white. Because I'm being true to the de demographics, only one girl who's a protagonist is, you know, a black girl. And then you've got your one Hispanic, but everybody else for the most part is white. I had, I cannot tell you how many agents who are not black who wanted me to take my one black character. And I have one black, I have one shot with this story to have a redeeming black girl who makes me feel like myself, who can inspire other black girls who are reading it, who are going through. And then also for those who aren't of color can learn about black girls as well. And I, I cannot tell you how I was told it won't be believable because she had a mother and father who loved her, who worked really hard to pay tuition. And they thought that she should have the story as we all know what that story should be, going to a, a private school and being black. Somebody had to be incarcerated. Someone had to, there had to be some, some sort of fundamental deficit. It just couldn't be that she come from this, you know, solidly middle-class family. And I, you know, that is when I decided I'm going to take my show on the road. And when I learned getting in front of audiences and like Roxanne, literally putting myself on tour for pretty much two years, the amount of people who resonated with the story who were like, oh my God, I want to pass this on. But had I listened to the gatekeepers, I would have stayed on the shelf. So I, I had to push through that, that sort of stereotype of what, you know, I, should I have sold out my, my girl, the, my one shot for a black girl? Should I have made her a little more edgy? Should I have made her a little bit tougher? Did she need to have an attitude problem a little bit to make her more believable to the masses? Or could she just be a, a girl who wanted to go and get a good education like everybody else? And I chose, I chose to keep her as she was. And I've been very pleased and I feel very proud that I was strong enough to, to go through that. But I would say that there was a time in my earlier part of my writing where I wouldn't have felt as confident. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I think that's very important that, you know, we fight to make sure that we're not a monolith. We're all different kinds of people. We have all different kinds of views. We've grown up in a, in every way, like everybody else. We all have our own opinions. We all have our own lives to share. Those lives are important. Those lives matter. We should be able to share them. Absolutely. And I'm going to piggyback off of that with the next question I was going to have uh, Krishanda and uh, Tochi share, which was, with all the challenges we're facing right now in our country, how does who you are and where you are from shape your writing? And when you're writing, do you think about using your voice and platform to create awareness, edu to educate, reform, action? You can definitely, you know, further elaborate if you'd like. Tochi, you go first. I just Ooh. talked. <laughs> <laughs> this, it's actually something that I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, it's something that occupies a lot of my mental real estate generally, but particularly given the last, you know, I'd say, you know, eight to 10 months. I even, you know, wrote an essay about it on tour.com about, you know, the duty of the black writer during periods of American unrest, right? Like we're, for in many ways, we're sort of looked at and depended upon, depended upon to be these sort of translators of the Black experience, and in particular of Black trauma, right? We're mm -hmm. supposed to be able to articulate it for the, you know, upper class, upper middle class, white reading public. And we're expected to do this, particularly given the way that the attention economy is structured right now, you know, we're expected to do this literally as soon as the next hashtag appears. And like, if I weren't a human being, if I were a robot, you know, maybe it would be easier for me to sort of jump into that duty. But, 
you know, I watch somebody who looks like me, who looks like my dad, who looks like my uncle, you know, essentially have the life crushed out of them over the course of nine minutes hmm. on camera. And I have to process that. And in addition to process that field requests on what this means for the country when I'm going through my own very personal sort of, you know, tra traumatic aftermath. And so like, I think for me, one of the things that, that I come back to is this sort of aspect of, of self-care and also sort of cultivating or trying to cultivate a sort of healthy selfishness. Um, mm -hmm. Some days I literally just want to turn on my Xbox and play. Like, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to talk to anybody. You know, I don't want to talk to any non-black people, particularly yeah. about black stuff. Like I, mm -hmm. I just literally, I want to hop on Twitch and I want to play some video games. Um, and I think that's an important, I think that's an important habit and dynamic to cultivate because I, I think another aspect of it too is we're expected to articulate our humanity. And my whole thing is like, you know, if you didn't already believe in my humanity, like I don't think you're my audience. Like I, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not writing for you. People there, you know, there's a portion of Riot Baby that takes place in, in Rikers. And, you know, a lot of people talked about how the incarcerated were were humanized in that section for them. How, like, oh, I didn't know it was like this, and and it was very important for me to show people behind bars uh, in this situation where it's not just omnipresent violence all the time. Like, mm -hmm. people there are concerned with gardening. People there do book clubs. Like, it's, there's so much life and humanity that happens in these places. And people were like, oh, Tochi, like, you really humanized the incarcerated for me. Well, what were they before you read my book? Mm -hmm. You know, like, how did you think of the incarcerated before you read my Like, I'm happy you put money in my pocket buying my book, but like, I wasn't, I, the purpose of my writing that book and writing that portion of the book wasn't for you to suddenly see black and brown incarcerated people as human. They're already human to me. They should already be human to you. And I mean, maybe for the next book that you encounter, the next story you encounter, whether on TV or film that contains incarcerated people, maybe they will have already been made, maybe they will already be human in your mind to you. So I think, you know, going back to the genesis of the question, I, you know, I want to be, I want to think more about me. And I think a lot of a lot of black creatives, particularly when sort of hounded to, to you know, speak to these non-black audiences about black trauma, you know, I think it's an important lesson to care about yourself and to do what you can to, you know, sort of keep your sanity amidst all of this because we quite literally have skin in the game. Yeah, and I think that too, when you're when you're thinking about what happened to George Floyd or any any people, anyone who is being uh, brutalized by uh, law enforcement or just average people on the street with no regard to our humanity, you know, um, as a black person, you almost can't help but not connect. You know, I, I would say that everyone on this panel, you know, has come to some level of accomplishment in their lives. They're, you know, on some level, they're, you know, not in the environment that's going to sort of put them directly in, in harm's way that way. But, you know, we never know. All you have to do is walk across the street these days. You can just be breathing while Black and something can happen to you. And then they, you know, sh oftentimes they shoot first and ask questions later. Um, but for me, you know, I started off really humbly in my my life. I'm a, you know, product of teen pregnancy. <clears throat> you know, there's a score that has to do with trauma. And it's called the ACE score. And I check, you know, a number of those boxes. Um, but I was intervened by a family member, and that's what shifted my life. So um, there's a part of me that will always be that little girl in Milwaukee. So whenever I see or hear, it doesn't matter how high or how accomplished or how many dinners I've attended or what's the shoe count, I will always be connected. And I think as black people, even if you were raised, you know, like my kids who they weren't, they didn't have to see that, which I'm very grateful that, you know, we have gotten better this generation, but because it's still in my family, they are just a stone's throw. So they still are going to connect to it. It's almost impossible that, you know, it's one of the beauties of being of color or being black. I mean, I speaking specifically about, about black people that we, we generally don't run, you know, we become successful 
We still have Uncle Junebug or Ray Ray who is in this space and we still claim him as our own. And those people, those characters often fuel the richness in our characters. It often brings authenticity to the work that we bring to the table. And it brings us, you know, not a shred of humility, um, a poignant piece of humility that makes a lot of works that have to do with like, you know, from Langston Hughes to, uh, you know, to Maya Angelou, you know, that work is supreme, but it's not coming from the space of not connecting. It's coming from a space of absolute connection. So I always want to be in a space where I don't forget um, who that little girl is in Milwaukee. Um, I never want to be in a place where I become so accomplished where I can't recognize myself and another little girl who was also really trying hard to get educated, but for whatever reason is not able to at the time. Um, and so I'm all in my work and which is why I typically fight for it. And, you know, a family member sent me this article with Ava DuVernay years ago. This is before I decided to go, you know, solo on my mission of putting out my own work. Um, and it was an article that where she spoke about, you know, you no longer have to wait for people to tell you it's okay to put your work out in the world. You can just do it. I mean, there's all these platforms to do it. And it was so freeing for me to read that. I go, I'm gonna open a website <laughs> and I'm gonna have a blog or I'm just gonna start writing essays. And before you know it, you find so many people who can relate to you. And that just continues to bring confidence to you as a writer. Although, as we all know, it can be painstakingly lonely, but what comes out of it is something that really can bring people together. So it's such an honor and a gift to be in the position of, of a, a scribe, quote unquote. Uh, I have to add to that, that I feel like immediately in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, I think the one time that I actually kind of felt not calm, but like a little relief was when somebody posted online, your black friends don't want to talk right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're now highlighting, you know, you need to understand how difficult it is to be on Zoom for work talking about any and everything while this is going on in the back of your head. I appreciate the fact that I feel like we're now telling people we need a break. You will hear from us when we're ready. You will, you'll hear from, uh, you, you'll hear from our emotions. You'll hear what we have to say once we process this. And I think that's something that even I avoided initially when, you know, with previous tragedies that have happened, just out there on Facebook, just going after it, just going after it, just yelling at people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's, it, it was the severity of the situation uh, or the fact that we couldn't escape it because we were all in quarantine, but it was a lot. And it felt really nice that somebody finally said, you know what? Take take all take all the moments you need. Take several seats, and just figure it out. Process as you can, and you know, no pressure on how fast it has to be. And in fact, let me check in on you and make sure you're okay. You don't even have to answer me back. Stuff like that, I really appreciated, and I think was really important in this time. And, and I don't know, you guys might tell me. Maybe in that time, maybe you found a voice for something to write about, found a voice to speak to anything, th that event or anything in general. You know, I, it, I get asked to write about current events quite a lot. And I understand where that impulse comes from. But fortunately, the deeper I've gotten into my career, the more I've been able to say, I might, but I'm not ready yet. Um, because there is this cycle that's relentless. And it was created, I think, in large part by 24-hour news. This idea that there is a content machine that needs to be fed. And it doesn't matter what you put in, just that you put something in it. And when I look at the issues that we're talking about these days, um, 
with everything that it, that is at stake with the presidency, with everything that we're protesting with, you know, George Floyd, I think broke a lot of us because it was just so long. And I had stopped watching videos of police murdering black people because I, you know, when you've seen 10, you, you get the gist of the next 15. But for whatever reason, I ended up watching the George Floyd video and I, I just, thought, my God, when is this going to end? And I kept looking and I was like, oh my God, it's only been two minutes. It's only been five minutes. And then it was eight and a half, eight minutes, 45 seconds. And I, you know, it took me a long time to be able to write something about it because first of all, I had to feel just grief and rage and all of that coupled with the disgrace that is the presidency um, and the way this country is responding to this man like, I, you know, I, I was not optimistic that he was going to lose, but now I think he's actually going to get blown out. But there's still going to be about 40, 45 percent of this country that's going to vote for him. And so I'm trying to also grapple with the fact, like, who are those 45 percent who are like, mm, the economy is completely distrashed and he's a selfish, petty tyrant who's also stupid. But I think I'll go with this guy. Um, and so I just have been trying to take the time because I don't know how to not just vomit rage on the page. Like if I have something to say, I need it to be productive and meaningful. And so I'm fortunately finally finding words, but I, I certainly needed the time. And I think a lot of us have needed time. And frankly, I don't know that there's enough time when it comes to some of these issues that we're talking about. And, you know, I was thinking about what Krishanda said. The reality is that a lot of Black writers, I don't think people realize, like, we're literally one generation away from absolute poverty. You know, my parents are Haitian immigrants. And there's a trauma that comes with that. Like, when you know, not only are you one generation from poverty, but you still have family in poverty. And you're the person that's, like, lifting 100 people along with you. And um, that also creates an additional, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say burden, but responsibility in terms of writing, because there's a great deal at stake, not only for you, but for, you know, direct family members. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to continue with you, Roxanne, if you don't mind. Um, we're going to transition a little bit. I know that everybody here, as they've you know talked about writing, you know, screenplays and so on. So I wanted to talk about the industry. And Roxanne, I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on Hollywood's attempts at representation in media, specifically on screen? On screen? Yes, please. Yeah. Um. I think it's important to acknowledge progress when progress has been made. And especially in the past three or four years, I think we've started to see some real progress and it's encouraging. But what we're seeing is on the screen and we're not seeing a lot of change behind the camera and we're not seeing any change when it comes to executives embedded in the organizations to make these decisions. I've actually been fortunate. I've had black executives on every project. It's a miracle. Um, wow. But e right. But even with the black executives, it hasn't been enough to get anything made because they're surrounded by white executives. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people understand just what we're working against in terms of the biases in the system. Like when I was shopping in Untamed State, which is my first novel um, to sell, and we did end up selling it. I sat in a meeting at a major studio and the guy said, why should I care about black women? And I was just like, oh, I mean, did you think you were thinking that thought? Like, he really was comfortable. And, and the people around him were like nodding, like he had asked a profound question. Hmm. And so when I see the progress, um, I'm really encouraged by um, Misha Green with Lovecraft Country, Michaela Cole, um, with I May Destroy You and seeing people who have like specific points of view and getting some of that like Wes Anderson freedom. I, I think like now we're doing something, of course, Ava DuVernay, um, but we can still name us in the industry. And like, if I sat here and thought about it, I could probably name like all 15 people 
who are currently uh, in development or like doing great things. Oh, that's more than 15, but you know what I mean. Uh, so I'm encouraged, but it's like, it seems like for every step forward, there are several steps back and it's this constant uphill battle and it's happening while people are expecting us to sort of be grateful for the scraps and be grateful for what little change that we're seeing. And even the change that we're seeing, there are so many things that are, are, are at play, like colorism. Like when you look at all of the creators who are making projects right now and who are getting deals, most of us are reasonably light-skinned. And that means something. It's incredibly terrible. Like Michaela Cole is an outlier in terms of who gets attention from Hollywood. So I hope that there's a space to be able to talk about these things and to talk about the progress that has been made while also acknowledging just how far we have to go and, and what specifically needs to be done to, to bridge that distance. Thank you. That, that was tremendous. I appreciate that. Appreciate your candor and your honesty. <laughs> um, uh, uh, to Krishanda, uh, what are your thoughts about opportunities for black filmmakers and producers in this new Hollywood world? Well, I think it's in a nutshell for black people, it's totally Robert McKee. It's like show don't tell. Mm. So you really have to like, you know, prove yourself. Um, there's a story, it's a magical realism and science fiction that I've been writing with a partner for years and it's called The Forever Tree. There's a short film to it and there's this another bigger version of it. Um, but when we were shopping that film, you know, no one could believe, would believe a black girl on the quest, you know, it's very much like Indiana Jones, but imagine a, like a, you know, 20 something year old black girl going through all this stuff and just doing all these stunts and everything. It's really fascinating. Then we're weaving magical realism in it. We're, 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 we're weaving in historical fantasy. Um, and I had seen all those types of films before, but they were never with people who look like me. So we literally had to raise um, a budget to create the short film and then put it through film festivals to prove that this was that this storyline could be possible. And from it, there was all this, you know, really great press that that was the result. Uh, lots of people, uh, industry people, I mean, uh, heralded it. Um, what a what a fascinating tale. What a fresh take. But I can recall just saying those things that we had had we had to show by raising funds to do on our own. And nobody believed me. Whereas, you know, I don't want to name any names, but I think about the stories that I hear um, of people who are, you know, young writers or youngish writers who have uh, concepts for stories and for film and television shows. And they literally just have to, you know, write a little bit on a piece of paper, give a general idea of what they're thinking of. And, and just like that, they have a writer's room. And you're just like, <laughs> Wow, someone's gonna take a shot on someone's gonna take a take a chance on your idea that you wrote like, you know, five hundred words, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas for us, there's all these hoops and this and this that we have to go through. But then when it's shown, then they say, Oh wow, that's really interesting. But so it isn't as if the opportunities don't come, but still there's all this extra work that people of color, black people I am speaking of, because I am one, have to go through to get to that space. So there was a time where even when we did the work, people would still shut the door. So I suppose we are making progress to Roxanne's point. Yet I await the day when we will be able to be recognized and acknowledged for just the great concept that somebody decides they want to develop just the concept. Yeah. Or hey, let's think about that. Let's 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 actually invest some actual time. Um, and the, the line of why should I care about a black woman, I just think, you know, I immediately run over a litany of films where there's a white woman as a protagonist. And the message is, you should care about white women. <laughs> and every, I mean, I can give you like off the top of my head, it's like this film and this film, this film, where it's like from, from rom-coms to historical treasures. Um, but for black women, we still have that, that, you know, still have that work to do. But I am, I am obviously still in the game and will continue to be in the game because what, what perhaps is wanted by some is to be, the, be frustrated to the point where you just exit. 
and, and that's not even an option because as Maya said, I come as one. I don't mean to be sappy here, but we know the rest. <laughs> so I got I got ancestors on my side. I'm not gonna bow out that easily. <laughs> Bring up an important point though that doesn't also I mean there's so many things that don't get talked out of talked about enough, but like the expectation and the amount of work that we have to do to get and we were Toshi was also talking about this earlier, like the amount we have to do to get into the room and have hmm. a seat to even maybe be considered versus like the napkin story and people think you're exaggerating, but like, that's literally kind of how girls got made. And I was trying not to name names. Right oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll name names. And no, I, we're, we're spilling tea on this panel. I'm not jealous. I'm angry. No, no, no. Cause it's a great show, but it's just that why can't we have similar outcomes? You right. know, like I would love to just hear a similar outcome because I'm I'm all about women empowerment. So you know, we come as girls. I'm all of I'm all of us. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. first and foremost, every single woman. Uh, you know, I feel like we already have our work to do. At the same time, there's still that extra barrier when you are a brown girl. For sure. Like I'm taking a show out right now, and I don't need to do anything. Like I know how to pitch this show. I've been working on it for a year. I'm good. And meanwhile, the studio exec is like, no, we need you to come up with a pitch document. So I have an 18 page single space document. And it's just like, this is a show Bible. Any white man would take this and get a full series order. And meanwhile, you want me to do this just to get into development. It, and it, it's infuriating, but you're also right that like, if we get so angry that we leave, they, they win. And then we don't get to make these great shows that center black lives and different kinds of black lives. Uh, yeah. And so it's just one of those, like, this is the system and we have to try and change it, but man, they make it hard. It's not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. Right. right. Absolutely. But okay. every time we see one get through, it inspires us to keep it moving. So, you know, we have to celebrate and keep it going. There is absolutely no, sort of um, wins that you will receive by, you know, having a bitter attitude if you are feeling wronged. You can have those feelings because I believe the spectrum is real, <laughs> but you have to put those to the side and then get back up and say, you know what, this is worth it. And, you know, you keep pushing long enough. Um, I believe, I really just believe in the power of persistence and the power of alignment. I just really believe that I didn't make it this far Somebody didn't believe in me when I was a kid in Milwaukee, whether it be a family member or whatever. You know, I didn't make the strides of, no, you can't have this. Okay, I'm gonna try this route and then that be successful for me. You know, I'm just gonna keep on going. There is a line where Will Smith, he's so awesome when he says this, uh, he was interviewed by Tavis Smiley. And he says, you know, I don't profess to be the best actor. I don't profess to be the, you know, the best or what have you. He says, but you will not outwork me. You will not outwork me. He says, if we get on the treadmill, you're on one and I'm on the other, I'm either going to die or you're going to get off. <laughs> and he owned a day of the year. Huh? He owned a day of the year. Like independent, like there was a there there was a period in the 90s where there was a like I think it was Independence Day actually, where every year that was like Will Smith Day. Like he had a movie coming out that year. And you're that right. Was, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the best revenge. Listen, success is the best revenge. So I just put on my Will Smith face and say, let's get on the treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> love it love it uh okay well i was gonna ask this question to tochi but you know we've already talked about it so let, let's talk about it so shows like watchmen lovecraft country atlanta and then movies like get out and the upcoming Candyman film uh what do you think is the connection between science fiction horror black stories and the black experience we can start with tochi and then we can expand from there oh man i could go on for a whole other hour I <laughs> it's, that question. it's fascinating it's fascinating. It, it really is i do think a common thread in all of those projects you know particularly you know you you look at the thematic preoccupations of a show like watchmen 
um, you know, Lovecraft Country and Get Out, there's this sort of, and I think you see it too in a lot of science fiction and fantasy literature, particularly with N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy. And shout out to N.K. Jemisin, just got a, a announced as a Genius Grant recipient earlier today. So shouts to her. Um, but there's this decolonization of genre happening. And it's, it's it, these are the, the, the gorgeous fruits of the effort of what happens when you have the children and grandchildren of empire writing speculative fiction. Science fiction is, in, is inherently colonialist. Like all these first contact stories that started the genre are about white heroes going to alien planets and killing the aliens, like literally committing genocide, and they're the heroes, right? And now you're seeing so many of these stories told from the perspective of what would have been considered the alien. Right, you have these stories from from you know perspectives such that you can look at a show like Lovecraft Country and really ask yourself the question: Who are the real monsters? You know, the 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 things with three eyes or the cops? And you like it could be it could be both and right like and that I think is an incredible and incredibly necessary perspective that Black creators can bring to genre. I like the 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 terrain is so rich for us. And I think like, it's another thing too, that science fiction and fantasy, speculative fiction in general, you can operate as metaphor and reality simultaneously. So, you know, you can look at, you know, the whole dying earth subgenre of science fiction as, you know, climate change parables. And that is one of the reasons why I think Get Out works as well as it does, is that, you know, it's, it's 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 almost like it's metaphor and reality at the same time because there are so many things that you could watch in Get Out and be like, oh, that's my life. But also like for real, like that's my life. Like if you're a black dude who ever dated a white girl in like the Northeast, like I'm sure there were many, many, many flashbacks that you were having during that, you know, meeting the family, like going to the house. Like I feel like particularly in the environment that, that, you know, I was lucky enough to be in by virtue of, of of being a scholar with a better chance. You know, I met many similarly situated, you know, black males who like I could talk about these situations with and and what have you. And, you know, you see a movie like Get Out and you're like, oh, wow, that how did Jordan Peele like literally get into my head and <laughs> dig out my life? But also you have, you know, you can have a scene like, you know, Allison Williams' character literally going through like online pages and looking at basketball players trying to find the next specimen mm -hmm. for her like experiments and whatnot. And you can see, you're like, oh wow, that's so many different things. That's, you know, professional sports. That's, that's so many different things that are happening that are a reality right now. When you have the perspective that black people are bringing to these genre conventions, like it's just the storytelling is so incredibly rich. Does anybody else have anything to add? I, I think um, I, I would like to say <laughs> that just with regard to storytelling too, you know, um, you, it's like when someone says, oh, you're a black writer. And I'm like, no, no crap. I'm totally, <laughs> you can look at me and tell this. Um, but I'm not coming to the table as a black writer per se, because you know, there are nuances in my in my experiences if I'm writing about something that's nonfiction that may hearken to the culture. But much of my writing has to do with empathy and just trying to get more people to recognize themes. And thematically, as human beings, we experience the spectrum of emotion. So I was giving this talk in your neck of the woods, Roxanne, uh, with a uh, private school. Uh, I think it was at Castaleja um, uh, there and telling them something along the lines of, you can't say that you don't relate to somebody if you're trapped in an elevator with them for an hour and then somebody's parched and before you know it, you're sharing the same, this is pre-COVID obviously, you're sharing the same <laughs> water bottle because you're both uh, thirsty. And then you both learn that even if she's wearing a hijab, you both are mothers, you both love your kids. And so all those nuances are just cool details, but the themes of your lives are the same. And what I've been trying to inspire with the writing that I've been doing over the years, which I don't think that I did it in intentionally, 
um, though I am intentional with my writing, I didn't think that they would have like a common thread. But when I put all the works together, I realized that it had a lot to do with empathy and just trying to get people to, to look at stories, specifically if they're black, and humanize them. This is a story about a black person, but guess what? You have the same experiences. Oftentimes when you see a show that's black and the cast, the ensemble cast is black, you often will have more viewers that are of color because they just, the assumption is people can't relate to that. Why would a bunch of white girls watch Girlfriends? What are they gonna, how are they gonna connect? Everybody on the show looks like they're black, but the same show that has to do with all white girls called Sex in the City, all of my friends love that show <laughs> and we're black. You know, many of us are black. Uh, I, I cannot wait for the day when we break through that as black writers, where we can see our stories as experiences and themes and thematically people can connect to them and celebrate those nuances that are different. You know, the whole, Hey girl, which is very black, you know what I mean? Or, you know, y'all, which is a very Southern thing versus, you know, you all or something like that. Those are all nuances. But by and large, the themes are what are supposed to connect us all. And, you know, through works like Get Out, which is why I connect on a different level to New England schools and whatnot, um, I didn't have that exact experience, but it was the themes that drew me in. And so through the work of Roxanne's, through the work of Tochi's, et cetera, you know, and, and David, that's what I feel like, even if we're not trying, as writers who put our heart and soul into the work, that's kind of what part of our intention is to get people to look at us and look at the, the stories as human, first and foremost. Absolutely. Thank you so much for answering these questions. I really appreciate it. And now we're going to transition over to Q&A. Okay. So coming from our uh, audience has been watching us. Uh, first question is, you know, we've been talking about it both outside of this conversation and in this conversation a lot about you know pain you know it, it, it's it's part of what's happening with us right now it's been part of us since the beginning but what the audience really wants to hear about is joy so what are some ways that you use writing for joy uh, you know joyful things that you write about you know what are those things and we could even talk about it in media as well like, you know, joyful things that we see when we see us on screen, um, anything like that. I mean, I think we should just do a rendition of Rob Bass's Joy and Pain because I, <laughs> I, now I have that song in my head. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's incredibly important to talk about joy. Um, I still find genuine pleasure in the act of writing. I love it. It's my favorite thing to do. I kind of feel like it's the only thing I'm good at. And um, I love being able to bring complexity to our stories because it isn't just pain, but the pain is there. And uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that pain because especially as black women, we are encouraged to be impervious and strong. And what people think strength is, is never admitting that we're human, that we have feelings, that we feel pain. So part of joy is acknowledging pain and having the space to, to talk about what that pain looks like and feels like. But also there's joy in being able to write about happiness and what happiness can look like and um, love and what love can feel like. Uh, it's... Um, something I really love writing about love. And I didn't for a very long time because um, boundaries. And, you know, if you don't save something for yourself, like you it can be really problematic. And also just because I'm a writer and somewhat public figure does not mean my wife is, you know, wants to come along for that ride. She does. But, um, you know, I, there's something so joyful about being able to do that and to talk about like the ways in which my life has changed over the years. Um, so I just, I just, there's joy in all of it from the practice, the opportunities that have come my way. Like recently had the opportunity to edit an anthology or put together a selected works of Audre Lorde. And I never would have imagined that I would be able to do a project like that. And to be able to do that and spend a year reading her work 
and re being reminded of what an incredible scholar she was. I have a cuckoo clock, sorry. <laughs> um, it, it was just such a joy. And like, there's also just joy in the opportunities. Anybody else? Yeah, it's it's funny. I was thinking about it just now, and they're the only stories that I think I've I've written that have not sort of in any way, shape, or form involved, uh, you know, black pain or white supremacy. Have all been con commissioned by black people. Like now that I think about it. Mm. There, there was this anthology, Black Enough, that was edited by E.B. Zaboy. Uh, she was nominated for the National Book Awards some years back for her novel, American Street. And it's a series of stories by young adult, by Black young adult uh, authors. And it's all about the sort of variegated aspect of, you know, the, the young Black experience in America. You know, you have stories about, you know, Black girls in the Pacific Northwest going hiking and, you know, black kids at the pool. And it's all about all the different ways you can be a black kid. And I wrote this story about this young, you know, Nigerian American son of immigrants who's a debate champion who gets introduced to heavy metal. And it was so much fun to write. It was it like I had such a blast writing this story. And literally every time that I think about this story, because I was that kid, you know, I when I was in middle school, when I was in high school, I loved, you know, System of a Down, Slipknot, like all these bands that like, you know, according to stereotypes, I wasn't supposed to be listening to, right? Slipknot, wow. Yeah, exactly, right? And I like, I was such a huge metalhead and it was a thing that I loved so much and to have the opportunity to write about a thing that I loved that was particularly meaningful. There was another, there's another book that was announced uh, earlier today, I think, um, uh, Black Boy Joy. I think that's the title of the proposed anthology uh, edited by Kwame Mbalia, who, you know, he's a middle grade author of, of Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. I think the sequel is Tristan Strong Destroys the World. Incredible, incredible, incredible writer. And he basically gathered together all these, all these, um, black male authors to write stories about black joy. And I have a story upcoming in that about, you know, uh, a, a boy who loves skating and loves skateboarding. And like that, like the things that bring me joy, not just to do, but also to, to watch other people doing and that like being able to tap back into those aspects of my life, my adolescence and whatnot, um, that, that brought me such incredible joy, I think is so, it's so wonderful. And it like, it's not lost on me that the people that I've written these stories for, the people that have asked for and paid me for these stories are all black. Wow. So there's like this, there's this hunger for it. Yeah. We're looking for it too. And we should be able to sell that as well. Um, okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, so again, to everybody, how can we encourage the youth of today to embrace reading a book <laughs> when there's so many social media distractions, you know? Uh, and then also, you know, do you have any advice uh, that you'd like to share for any young ABC scholars uh, as they navigate their own personal journeys? Because it's very interesting, you know, like, Tochi and I, we're both, you know, class of 2005, but Tochi went to private school, right? And mm -hmm. I went to a community school program. So even just in that, you know, I lived in a house with other ABC boys and went to the local uh, highly rated uh, public high school. You know, that experience, I mean, even back then when I was a kid, I was like, this needs to be a reality show. <laughs> yes. Just yes. like all the stuff that we were doing in that house alone. I was like, this is a reality show right here. Obviously it can't be, but um, <laughs> just the stories and different situations and scenarios we got into all kind of crazy. But um, so we, we have our, our year, you know, in common, but we have these different experiences. So, you know, and that was a bad tangent. Again, back to it. Uh, what would you say to encourage, you know, kids to read? And I guess well, e-readers work too. <laughs> well, I would say that um, 
I mean, I'm not, I can't speak for Gen X. I mean, I can speak for Gen X because that's what I am. I can't speak for Gen Z. Um, and then there's so many who attest to not reading and they still can be prolific in what they write and things like that. Um, I don't know how that is entirely real or something. I mean, maybe just call me old school, but I just, I just believe that the more things that you read, especially things that are at somewhat length, the more inspired you will be, the broader your vocabulary becomes, you know, the more ways you learn to say the same thing. And, you know, I don't know if you're able to really strengthen that muscle of writing without taking in, you know, uh, a litany of information, um, a litany of stories, learning about people. You know, you mentioned earlier, what gives you joy? I love to write about love. Like I just, it's like a huge passion of mine and not my own. I mean, other people's, I'm just like the fly on the wall. Um, but in, in order for me to have gotten to that space, I think it's because I'm a big love story reader. Like I love love stories. And I've become really fascinated with love stories that speak to Black people in particular, because that's something that we don't really read about a lot or see a lot on television screen. And it could just be a story about two people in love, but just the fact that they're brown is a mirroring image for young people to see that. Um, I, I don't, I, I can't really say that you, you can sort of omit the reading piece and consider yourself a writer or to say that you wanna be a great writer and you have not read the works of Baldwin, you have not read the works of Hooks, you have not read the works of Gay. <laughs> you know, you have to take this energy in, again, to just help strengthen your own muscles. So if you, if you claim that you wanna write, there's, there's work to be done. And, and you find that even if it seems like it's painstaking in the beginning, the more you get involved in the story, you will become addicted. I mean, you can't help it, especially if it's written well, you won't be able to help yourself. So I just, I just you know, urge somebody to just open a book, one that you've heard of that's really good, and you'd be surprised at how fast you end it just because the stories are just, just that enriching. Yeah, I would say to get people to read, you have to give them access to books. It, it really is that simple. A lot of times, talk about we have to get people to read like and these things are not going to just magically happen and so you have to put books in front of young people the national book foundation does quite a lot of work in this realm dolly parton of all people does quite a lot of work in this realm i think in fact she is like the number one distributor of books in the country um like she's giving like at a level of hundreds of thousands it's really quite remarkable what she's doing and has done, I think, for the entirety of her career. Uh, and so I think it's all about access and you know, writing good books that young people are gonna wanna read. We're not competing with social media. It's really, that's not what we're competing with. We're competing with the idea that there's nothing interesting in books and that there's nothing like innovative. But if we put a bunch of riot babies in front of kids, they're going to read it. I mean, that book is dope. It's just like you can read it from the first page. <laughs> it's got magic in it. It's got real issues that kids are dealing with. It's got, you know, fun and it's got this tight sibling relationship. It's so intensely warm, but also it's just weird. And, and so like just giving them the opportunity by creating ways for them to get at the books. I mean, libraries are a thing, but there are other ways of doing that and just not making it seem like medicine. So often we make reading seem like this huge obligation and that you're like a better person if you read, which you are. But uh, <laughs> I think if we just make opportunities for young people to read books and we don't put a lot of pressure on it and we don't put a lot of value judgment on it and let children and young people come to literature however they want. Uh, and let them know that whether you're reading Baldwin, which is also essential, um, or you're reading Krishanda's work or mine or Toshi's work or any of the contemporaries, it's okay if that's where you're starting, if you're not starting with the Baldwin or the Alice Walker or the Toni Morrison, but I, you know, hopefully you'll get there. Um, even if you don't, the reading is reading. I don't care what you read. And I always tell my students this, if, if James Patterson is your jam, <laughs> 
okay, but we're going to talk about why there's better literature out there. Um, and, and so I just try to meet people where they're at. And I think if we do that a little bit more, uh, I think we will see more people reading. And I also think that better books, you know, I think it's our responsibility to get people reading by writing things that they might want to read. Yeah, no, I think the access point is so important. I mean, it's it's like voting, right? Like you can say vote, 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 vote. But until, you know, until the Shelby County decision gets reversed and, you know, all these voter registration and voter ID laws and all these structural barriers that have been put in place to prevent people from vote, voting are broken down, it's going to be difficult and immensely inconvenient and nigh impossible for a ton of people to vote who would otherwise want to vote. And it's, I, I think with regards to access to books, it's so important because, you know, I think there's only so much power in the writer's hands. I think a lot of this is, uh, is the onus of, you know, publishing houses, publicity and marketing departments. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're organizing a tour for, you know, somebody like me, they'll have all these places that they'll send me to, all these festivals and whatnot. These are all, these are places that a lot of kids in underserved communities don't have access to. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't necessarily have people who have the resource to drive them however many miles to, you know, whatever the venue of this book festival is. They don't necessarily you know, go to the high school that's able to sponsor a ton of writers to come through for their festival or for their event or what have you. Um, and, you know, it's almost like pulling teeth to get your publisher to send you to, you know, a high school in the Bronx, mm -hmm. you know, to just talk to kids. And like, there's literally the, the next, you know, whatever, you know, whether it's, you know, Baldwin, Walker, or even Je like next Jemison, the next, you know, whatever could be sitting in that class and no writer has been put in front of them to let them know that they can be a writer mm -hmm. and that that is like, that is a possibility for them. And so I think, you know, as much as we talk about, you know, the things that, the things that storytellers can do, I think it's also imperative that we that we bring this conversation to the people with entire departments that are geared towards getting books out in front of people. Um, I think that's such a huge, huge, huge thing. I think this, the second thing that I want to say, the second and final thing on this point that I want to say is, um, is to point to a sort of democratization of reading um, inspiration or the stories that you imbibe. Like you can see I have you know, this six volume hardcover reissue of uh, Akira, you know, sitting on my shelf is one of my prized possessions. That's a graphic, that's a manga, you know, that's a, that's a graphic novel. Um, you know, my head's kind of blocking, but right next to it, it's a string of graphic novels from Marvel. And, you know, Riot Baby, you can read Riot Baby and see the influence, the X-Men influences. Like you can see the anime influences there. And, you know, I grew up as part of the Toonami generation, you know, Gundam Wing, Outlaw Star, like these were the stories that I was imbibing. And yes, I was, I was reading a ton, but also a lot of how I learned how to tell story, I learned from watching anime. And there, like, all you have to do is hop on TikTok for like two seconds and you'll see there's this entire genius pool of black content creators who are the biggest weebs on the planet. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Like we love anime and we grok it. Like we we understand it. We can tell all these different, you know, we can we can note all these different story conventions in it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can analyze it, we can dissect it, we really understand it and can apply it to, you know, other forms of media. And I think if if young storytellers can hear that that is also like legitimate homework in terms of in terms of learning how to tell a story i think that can go a long way towards encouraging mm -hmm. future scribblers like if if your inspiration for telling stories is avatar the last Air airbender that's valid like that's absolutely valid also that is a damn well told story absolutely absolutely i just want to thank all three of you so very much for taking the time to speak with me this evening and speak for our, speak to our audience i just love the fact that we can talk about writing we can talk about creativity we can talk about the importance of love and joy but also taking a break and you know taking care of yourself we can talk about television we can talk about 
mangas, all that stuff, all of that encompasses writing. And um, it's so important for all of us to know that we can tell our own stories. And that's the most important part. Tell your story. And by telling it specifically, you kind of tell it universally. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Krishanda. Thank you, Tochi, for spending time with me this evening. And have a good night. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Like that's been wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to meet you all as well. You too. Oh, wonderful to meet you. Bye.